Good evening, everybody. It's Pastor Mike here for Harvest Family Fellowship for a Friday evening Bible study. Uh, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, I do apologize for missing last week, but uh, we're going to dive into Romans uh, some more. Um, try to get caught up to where everybody is on Wednesday because um, we're following along uh, with that Bible study uh, here. And so. Uh, the last time that I was on, we, we stopped at verse 18 of chapter 1, so that's where we're going to pick up. Um, this section of scripture uh, that we're going to read tonight um, is pretty, um, well, it's, it's, it's pretty, um, it's one of those scriptures that can kind of hit home. Uh, it kind of make you realize... Um, where you've where you've messed up, you know, and it's it's talking a lot about humans' tendency um, to sin. Um, it's talking about uh, a lot about how the root of of our sin is idolatry, and that because we have sin, uh, we really have no right to judge other people. So it's um, you know that's the gist of of this section of scripture, um, you know, Paul has just finished up, you know, talking to the Romans about his his desire to come see them, um, and then, man, Paul just jumps right in to like some really weighty issues. So um, let's just read along, and I'll just read a little bit, and then I'll stop, and we'll talk about um, what Paul's saying. So verse eighteen. Uh, starting there, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power in divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what what has been made so that people are without excuse. Okay, we'll just stop there for a second. So what Paul is saying here is that, um, you know, he's talking about the wrath of God. Um, and of course, we know that God, you know, in this new covenant provides grace and forgiveness and mercy. Um, but what Paul is saying is that godless people, um, can sometimes incur, you know, God's um, wrath. And, and, you know, we don't exactly know what God's wrath looks like in the New Covenant. In the Old Covenant, of course, God's wrath could be very, very powerful and very, very destructive. Um, you know, in the New Covenant, it's, it's different. You know, God deals with us very differently. But I still think... Um, that when we do wrong, when we really flub our dub, God's disappointed. And, and sometimes, you know, God has to, to sort of get our attention and, and point us in, the, in a better way or, or get us refocused. Um, but essentially what Paul is saying is that God's wrath, whatever that l might look like in, in, our, in, in the new covenant we live in, um, is revealed when people suppress the truth of God by their wickedness. What does that mean? Well, what I think that means is that when we, let, when, when, when we as Christians, we know the truth. We know the truth about God, and yet we act in ways that are contrary to what we ought to be doing. I think it upsets God, okay? Um, and, it, and it suppresses the truth. So think about it like this. In the New Covenant, if if you know if what Jesus said said is true, and I believe everything he ever said is absolutely true. What, what it, but if what he said when he said love your neighbor is true, okay, if that's the second greatest commandment next to love God, and we do things that are that are absolutely not loving our neighbor, aren't we in a way suppressing the truth of God? Because that's people see. Instead of seeing the love of Jesus Christ poured out from an, one human being to another, instead they, they see a Christian that says they love Jesus, but that treats people very badly. And that suppresses the truth about God. 
Okay, when people see Christians behaving in a way that's not loving their neighbor, how are people going to know about God or see God or know his truth? So I think that's what Paul's talking about. You know, we suppress the truth by our wickedness, by not loving people. Um, and, and what he is saying next in verse 19, since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. Okay, and then he goes on to talk about God's invisible qualities. And he's talking about creation, everything that we can look at. I mean, you can, uh, you can look out at the stars on a clear night and just see all the stars, and I don't, I don't know how anybody that, that looks at that could ever come to the conclusion that that happened by accident. When I look at that, I'm like, wow. You know, like God did a really great work. And so the point Paul is making is that we don't really have an excuse. The truth about God has been made plain to us by his creation. We've been given his word. Um, you know, so as Christians, we don't really have any excuse, you know, to, to not know about God. Um, and so when we know the truth, about God because of the things we've seen in creation, the things that we've experienced with God, what we read about him in his word, and and we and yet we, we act in a way that is not loving our neighbor. Um, we suppress the truth. Other people are to see the truth about God because of the way we live. Okay? Um, so moving on, to verse 21, it says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, excuse me, I lost my place, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Okay. <clears throat> So what he's talking about there is idolatry. You know, that's that's basically what God, what Paul is saying, okay? Um, they didn't glorify God, they didn't give him thanks, but instead they in, indulged in idolatry, okay? And and we'll just talk about idolatry for just a second. You know, we can we might not realize it, but we can commit idolatry pretty easily. Um, anything that you and I put ahead of God becomes an idol you know we can make our kids an idol think about that like we can make our kids an idol you know that's why that's why god tested abraham when he asked him to kill to take isaac up you know to the mountain and sacrifice him he wanted to see you know if abraham had made an idol out of isaac and of course he hadn't and i think god probably knew that but i think maybe god wanted abraham to see that um, I think it's important for us to see that, you know, when we realize that, you know, even though I love my kids like this much, I still love God this much, you know, you know, and we have to make sure that we're putting him first uh, in our lives, you know, that, that he is our life, you know, that we're not creating some idol out of you know, whatever, our kids, as I said, or, or our job, you know, people can do that pretty easily, um, you know, hobbies, we can make an idol out of everything, and so Paul's talking about idolatry, and then he, and, and of course, Paul is also talking about, you know, people in the past, he's not necessarily, he, he's giving the Romans an example of how people can, uh, you know, live wickedly, okay, and so he says, therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Okay. And he's talking about not just making things more important than God. He's saying they worshiped things that were not God, things that were created rather than the creator. Okay, and then he says, because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with, with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Okay, 
Now, I'm not, uh, um, you know, Paul is not, listen, if this sounds like Paul is like c condemning and, and, and being judgmental and, and stuff towards homosexuals, um, that's not really what he's doing. What he's saying is that when, when these people that he's referring to gave in to their idolatry, God also allowed them to give in to a lot of other fleshly desires, okay? Paul is not like giving people permission to hate homosexuals. He's just saying when we start with idolatry, um, we can end up um, in a whole mess of other things, okay? You know, idolatry is really just the beginning. Then when, okay, so we, we're in idolatry and we don't worship God, well, if we're not worshiping God, what do we start to do? We start to worship the things of the world and start to act like, you know, the ways of the world. And, and that's what he's, he's saying, you know. Um, God said, okay, you guys want to commit idolatry and worship other gods. I'm going to let you just take this, this road as far down as it can go. Um, you, you know, so I don't think that Paul was trying to cherry pick that particular sin. He was just giving an example of what can happen. Okay. Um, because, and I'm going to tell you why that's true in a minute, because remember, Matthew tells us not to judge lest ye be judged. Right. So sin is sin. You know, it doesn't matter what you've done wrong. Um, it's wrong. And so, you know, to cherry pick a sin and focus on it is, is wrong also. So I don't think that's what Paul's doing. I think Paul's just giving an example uh, of what can happen to people when they, when they stop following God. You know, they can just, you know, it could have been, you, you could say the same thing about, um, you know, drugs and alcohol. Somebody that's, that's a Christian and is following Jesus, but starts to make an idol out of um, you know, let's say hanging out with their friends at a bar, you know, becomes more important to them than God. Well, then what could happen? Well, then, then they could develop alcoholism. You know, they could develop a dependency on alcohol or drugs. And, and, and all Paul is saying is that you can, you can spiral down, uh, from a place where you're serving God and worshiping God into a place where you don't even care about God. Okay, that's what Paul's really saying. Um, so, um, furthermore, he says in verse 28, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Okay, so there you go. Paul's saying, you know, they didn't think it was worthwhile to retain knowledge. And he's talking about God's knowledge, God's wisdom. Um, well, actually, he says to retain the knowledge of God. So God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. So, you know, we can even abandon the wisdom that God gives us and so become muddled and foggy in our thinking, okay? is essentially what Paul is saying there. And then he says, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of, of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know, listen to this, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also prove of those who practice them. So see, Paul Paul goes on there to just list a whole bunch of other things that human beings can become. We can become slanders. We can become God-haters. We can become arrogant and boastful. You know, they, we can become disobedient, in, uh, you know, uh, unfaithful. We can be without mercy. We can be without love. And that's what really Paul is talking about. You know, any sin... Um, that you and I um, could commit is covered. Okay, do you understand that? Like, is covered. We God has forgiven us of anything that we could ever do. So the trouble now is not uh, for us. Is not that we're going to go to hell because of one sin or another. God has forgiven us. You know, 
that that's not an issue. Jesus took care of it. But what is an issue is that when we have a sin in our life that we continue to come back to, whatever it is, you know, I don't, I don't care what it is. It could be, you know, um, gluttony. Okay, some people really like food way too much, um, of which I'm guilty sometimes. I think, um, but we can take the sin, whatever sin you struggle with in your life. And you can take that, and if you don't deal with it, it doesn't become a problem for God. You know, God isn't like, okay, I can only forgive you for this sin so many times. That's not, God will forgive you time and time and time again for, for something you might do. The problem is, um, we start to not control our sin, but our sin controls us. Okay, and that becomes a problem for us because then we're stuck in this situation that we can't get out of, uh, at least not without God's help. And, you know, that's that's how people get into addiction. You know, it starts out like they have a beer, you know, or they smoke a joint or whatever. And eventually, if they let that become, um, you know, and I'm not saying having a beer is sin. I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, they let that become something that controls their life. And when something controls your life, it's a problem, you know? Um, and so that's what I think we can take away from what Paul is saying here is, you know, if we allow ourselves to, to fall down the rabbit hole of any particular sin, so far that we we can't even get out um you know we're in a really sad place and so we need to be watchful you know be watchful um you know be mindful of what's going on in your life you know and you know that's how idolatry you know you you can take something like like i said like your kids loving your kids is is absolutely a good thing you should love your kids but if you love your kids more than god um, that can be a problem, you know, because God, um, you know, he said, love God first. That was the first thing, then love your neighbor. Um, you know, it got, it got the Israelites in trouble, right? Um, while Moses was up on the mountain getting the law of God, what were the Israelites doing? They were, they were making golden calf to worship, you know, and it became a problem because, and this is why it's a problem. It's not because God cannot look upon us when we have sin in our life. It's because when we, when we let a sin in our life completely control us, we can't focus on God anymore. You guys, does that make sense? Like, it, it becomes such a stumbling block for us to focus on God. And God is the very thing we need to sustain our life and to make our life full of joy. And so we have to be mindful and watchful like, you know, am I letting something become a sin in my life where it shouldn't be? Um, and so that's a good lesson to learn from what Paul is saying here. Um, now we're on to chapter 2, and this is where he gets really to his, you know, his point. He says, you therefore, okay, so in light of the, the Romans, now he's speaking about the Romans, Okay, you, the Romans, therefore, in light of everything I've just said, is what Paul is saying, have no excuse. You who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another. Hold on, let me get my page turned. You are condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. So stop right there. That's Who, who does that sound like? It sounds like Jesus when he said, you know, Hey, don't don't take the speck out of your brother's eye. You've got a plank in your own eye. Paul is saying the same thing, basically. You know, we, we have no excuse. The Romans had no excuse, and we have no excuse for judging other people because we have things in our lives, too. You know, this is why I made, you know, uh, it a point to, to just do everything I can to never judge anybody for anything, you know, um, except, you know, it, it, maybe if it's one of my brothers and sisters in Christ and I see them really struggling, you know, I might talk to them about it, 
Um, but as far as people that don't know Jesus, I don't judge them at all. I don't. I don't. They, there's no need for it because I have things in my life or have had things in my life that were problems as well. I've been in those places, you know, where things are getting in the way of my relationship with God. You know, and so that's what Paul is saying. You, you don't have any room to pass judgment on people because you've done the same things. And uh, I think Christians sometimes forget that. You know, I think that we think that we get to be the sin police, you know, and we don't. Like, um, you know, we'll just take the, the, you know, Paul was just talking a little bit ago about homosexuality. So let's just take that, you know, um, what I choose to do is, is, you know, whether it's someone who, who's, who's gay, someone who's a murderer, someone who is a pedophile, someone who's a rapist, someone who's, you know, think of anything that you might think is wrong, okay? And, and, and fill in the blank with that, okay? You can sit there all day and you can judge that person if you want to. And you can, you know, come up with ways to justify, you know, why, you, why you're judging that person. But at the end of the day, we have to ask ourselves, is my judgment of somebody else's sin or perceived sin going in any way to bring them closer to God? You know, if I judge them, is that in any way going to bring them closer to God? And I would have to say that the answer is no. You know, when we judge people, it's not going to bring them closer to God. It's going to push them away. But if instead we love them and don't even worry about, you know, the sin in their life, but worry about the person, okay, that can truly change their lives. And this is what I've chosen to do. In all those sins I just listed and all the ones that Paul has talked about, I just love the sinner. And if God wants to change something in their life, he'll do it. That's the that's the the stance that I've chosen to take quite a long time ago now. Like if God wants to change something in somebody's life, he'll do it. He doesn't need me to try to do it for him. He just needs me to love them and be a representation of his love. And um so, you know, And I, and I know that there are some people that probably, you know, some Christians that would probably say, well, yeah, Pastor Mike, but doesn't it, doesn't, doesn't God say to hate sin? Or, or doesn't it say that God hates sin? Well, yeah, you know, and I think that if we're to hate any sin, I think that what God might be talking about is we're to hate the sin in our lives. You know, uh, you know, we're, we're, we should take a look at, What's going on in Pastor Mike's life and and see whatever sin he might be up to and hate that, you know, not other people. Um, you know, because that's God's business. God convicts people's hearts, you know, I believe that. And and it, so if there is a sin problem in somebody's life, God sees it. God will deal with it. You know, we don't need to. Um, so anyway, moving on. Paul says, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. That's important. Okay, let's just stop right there. That's for a second because that's important. When we judge people, I want you to think about this. Really think about this. When we judge people, do we tend to judge them based on their intentions or the outcome of their actions? Okay. We judge them on the outcome of their actions. Okay. We look at their life, we see what they do, and we judge them for that. Okay, Without ever taking a second to consider what their intentions might have been. Now God, on the other hand, it says, it says that his judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So God looks at something somebody's doing, and he sees the motivation behind it. Okay, And, and so let me try to give you an example of what I mean. You know, you might have an addict, okay, um, you know, an alcoholic, let's say, and, and they have been 
trying to stay sober. Um, excuse me. They've been trying to stay sober, but the you know they fall off the wagon and they just go get, you know, just absolutely plastered drunk on a, on a Saturday night, let's say, you know, and and maybe I see that person, okay, and think, geez, man, they've got a real problem, like they need to repent, right? I just judge them for the action, but maybe is it possible? That that moment of weakness is like the first moment of weakness they've had in a year, okay? You know, they've been sober for a year before that. And their whole focus has been on following God and trying to stay sober. See, that's their intention. Their intention was to honor God, love God, and to stay sober. But they had a moment of weakness. And... and you know, we need to really think about that. Like, do we know the whole story? Do we know a person's backstory? Do we know where they come from? Do that? Do we know what they're trying to do? Because I'm telling you what, that matters to God. If he sees somebody struggling in a sin, but, but, but is struggling also to love him and honor him, I think that's of much more importance to God than when they make a mistake. Okay, and that's true for you, too, you know, like... And the, and the real problem is, is that we, we judge ourselves based on our intentions, okay? But we judge other people based on their actions. And that's just wrong, you know? Like, you, God knows people's hearts. He knows their hearts very intimately. He knows what their desire is, okay? And if their desire is to love and honor Him with their life, then who are we to judge a mistake that they've made or you know so anyway and then he goes on to say so when you a mere human being uh pass judgment on them and yet do the same things do you think you'll escape god's judgment or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness forbearance and patience not realizing that god's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance okay so what paul's saying is we can't escape god's judgment okay we can't escape it, you know. But here's the thing, the cool thing about it. What well, you know his kindness, his grace, his mercy, his love, his forgiveness is designed to bring us to repentance. And do you know what that really means? I listen, you know, you, you can listen to this the, the, this sermon series by Robert Morris, The God I Never Knew, it's called. And he talks a little bit about this, but Repentance is not necessarily meant to be like, oh, I, I'm convicted of my sin. Repentance and conviction is sometimes a conviction of our need for God. Okay, It's simply a conviction that we need God, that we're helpless to change without God. And His patience, His forbearance, His kindness, His love... All of those wonderful things about God are simply designed to bring us to that place where we realize what I've been doing isn't working for my life and I need God. Okay? And so, you know, Paul, you know, Paul's being very strong with the Romans. How can you guys pass judgment when you do the same thing? Do you think you can escape God's judgment? He asked them a question there. The answer, of course, is no. And then he asked them this other question. Do you show contempt? For the riches of his kindness, forbearance and patience. Okay? You know, as he's saying, look, guys, are you, first of all, can you escape God's judgment? No. The answer is no. And second of all, do you show contempt for God's goodness? You know, he's trying to make them aware of maybe, maybe you guys judge people um, because you feel like God shouldn't show kindness to some people. And, and it's easy to get into that, you know. Um, let me give you a really extreme example. You know, Adolf Hitler, man that killed 11 million Jews, gypsies, and Europeans. It would be very easy to think that someone like that is not deserving of God's kindness, but that would be wrong. The truth is, is that every single person, no matter how good or bad, 
is deserving of God's kindness and love and mercy and forgiveness. And so we need to keep that in mind. And obviously the Romans had a problem with this. Otherwise Paul wouldn't have been talking to them about it. Okay, but so here Paul's getting to the rub with the Romans. He says, but because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. Did you guys catch that? He's saying, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you're storing up wrath against yourself. Do you guys realize that when we are stubborn and unrepentant and judgy and all the terrible things that we can, we're not hurting God. God has dealt with the problem of sin. We're hurting ourselves. You know, that's what Paul's saying. You're hurting yourself. God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Did you guys hear that? God doesn't pick favorites. He doesn't have favorites. Um, it, he, Paul uses a phrase in here in verse 8, but for those who are self-seeking, and I want to talk about that phrase for just a second. I really think... I really believe that judgment of other people, when we judge other people, because that's Paul is talking about judgment a lot here. When we judge other people, I think that most of the time that judgment is a self-seeking kind of judgment. It, 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 we're not, we think, we, we, we get in our head and think that we're doing God's will when we judge other people. But really we're just most of the time doing it to make ourselves feel better. Okay, and I think that may be what Paul was getting at. He's like, you know, he's talking about how can you judge when, when you do the same things. How many Think about how many times you've judged somebody for um, a particular sin and the particular sin you're judging them for is the same one you're dealing with. Okay? We sometimes judge other people because we can make ourselves feel better about our shortcomings. You know, I really, I really believe that. And... Um, you know, because he says, but for those who are self-seeking and reject truth and follow evil, okay? You know, that that to me sort of sums it up, you know? I mean, I, I can think of many times where I have judged somebody for something and then later on I went, why... Why did you do that, you dummy? You, you're, you're dealing with the same thing. And the answer is, I made myself feel better. You know, which is a whole other kind of evil. Um, so, <clears throat> moving on to verse 12, Paul says, All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. Okay? For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, but their, on their hearts their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts sometimes accusing them, and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secret, secrets through Jesus Christ, as my gospel declares. So, what Paul is essentially saying there is that the Jews who had the law, okay, and the Gentiles who did not, okay, have the written down law, are really not so different, okay? Because I believe encoded in our in our in our hearts is is this internal moral code that God has placed there. Every human being on the earth knows 
deep down, even though maybe it's been suppressed, um, forgotten, you know, whatever, deep down they know what the right thing and the wrong thing are to do. And God is far more concerned about what we do than he is about what we say we believe. Do you guys catch that? God's more concerned about what we do than what we say we believe. The Jews thought that they believed, said that they believed in the law, right? But many, many of them neglected to follow it and to do the things that it said. And so the point Paul was trying to make was that, hey, there are some Gentiles out there, some non-Jewish people who stumble across the right thing to do in God's kingdom without ever having read the law. You know, and they will be justified or condemned based on what they do. Same as the Jews. You know, the Jews may have, the Jews had the law telling them what to do, and yet they still couldn't do the right thing. And so, you know, it, it goes back to that favoritism thing. God doesn't show favoritism. You know, the Jews may have been the people he chose to have a covenant with, you know, and they're the people he chose to to bring forth the Redeemer, the Messiah through. But the fact is, is that all human beings are God's creation. And in the hearts of every human being is the capacity to do the right thing or to do the wrong thing. And what's important isn't what you know about God. It's important, what's important is that you know God. And that if you know God, then I believe that you will just naturally tend to do the right thing. It's, a, you know, it's that relationship versus rules thing. I think that it's much more productive to give people a relationship with Christ. You know, introduce them to Christ. And as I said, let Him work on their their problems, their flaws. And I think you'll see that, um, you know, as their relationship develops with God, the things in the in their lives that you, you know, were like having to restrain yourself from judging them for, will start to work themselves out because God, you know, He, he works on people. Sometimes it takes, you know, a long time. Others, you know, it doesn't take long at all. But the point is, I think that, that God is looking for progress, not perfection from us. He knows that this side of eternity, you and I are not going to be perfect. He knows that. What he wants is for us to try to be better every single day. Just be a little bit more better for his kingdom. Um, a little bit closer uh, to him. And so we're going to stop there for tonight. Um, next week we'll we'll try to get through the rest of two and... and all of chapter 3, but I want you to think about this week, and, you know, if you happen to see me and want to talk to me about it, I'd love to talk to you about it more, but just think about ways that you could, you know, that you could or that you should reserve your judgment. You know, it's it's so tempting to be like, oh, I saw that person doing this thing. I gotta, I gotta tell them how wrong it was. It's tempting to do that, but it's not our job, you know. It's not our job to judge them. That's God's job. So think about ways where maybe, you know, as as uncomfortable as it might be to think about ways and and areas where you need to not judge people, you know, because <clears throat> I've noticed with people, some people have a really easy time giving grace to people that do X, Y, or Z, but not so easy a time giving grace to people that do A, B, and C. You know what I'm saying? Like, we all have our pet sins that we that we really like to come hard down hard on, and, and the truth is sin is sin to God. You know, it's not, it's not like he says, you know, murder is worse than stealing, or, like, they're all, they're all wrong to God, and, and, he just looks at it as sin. And and we don't do that as human beings. We we 
sort of categorize them, you know, from like worse to not so worse to lesser worse and on on down. So just think about that. And I'm going to do the same thing. You know, I, I, I certainly am not perfect in that area. So anyway, I hope that I didn't confuse you all too much. Um, sometimes I ramble, but um, I hope that, um, you know, you got the gist of what Paul's saying, which was, you know, we can't judge. We can't judge because we do the same things that other people do. So anyway, I want to pray for you guys. Um, Father, I just pray for those listening tonight. I pray that, first of all and foremost, that right now you would speak right into their hearts and remind them that they are your beloved child and that when you look at them, you don't see the sin and the ugliness in their lives. You see a wonderful child that you love. And then speak to them that you don't condemn them. Just like Jesus with that woman who was caught in adultery. You know, he made it very clear that he didn't condemn her. That he loved her. That he desired for her to sin no more. Not because... Not because the sin was preventing him from loving her, but because the sin was preventing her from coming to him. So speak to each heart about how you love them and about how you don't condemn them, about how you don't judge them, about how you don't hate them, about how you forgive them for everything. And Lord, help us to extend the same thing to other people, even though that's sometimes a hard thing to do. Help us to just extend that grace and mercy and forgiveness and love to other people. Help us not to see shades of gray uh, in regards to sin, but just to see instead people who are struggling with one thing or another and need our love and support so that they can see a way out of it. Lord, help us to be your hands and your feet and to display your love to all that we meet, Lord. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope that everybody has a good Friday evening and a good weekend. And, um, you know, maybe I'll see some of you guys on Sunday out at church. would love to have you there at 10 o'clock. Um, we're, we're right there in, in Liberty at 28 Schaefer Hill Road. Uh, right on the corner of, of Old 15 as you come into Liberty. So uh, anyway, good night and, and God bless all of you.